Welcome. I'm your Drew for today. Um, thank you. Uh, so today is our first day of halves. We'll be going through the teams. Teams, I've got your little warnings up here. Watch me for the, the timing. 15 minutes for presentation. We'll have five minutes for Q&A. And today's halves, so it'll be, for those of you who are new to this, it'll be the team will be explaining where they are in the project and giving us a sense of where they're going and what their work has been leading up to today. So with that, I think we're about ready to go. People look ready, I think the stream's ready. And starting kicking us off will be Little Big Engineers. And I'm doing your Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Half Presentations, and we are team Little Big Engineers. My name is Lori, and I am the set and theming engineer on the team. My name is Tai Yen Ko, Cleo, and I'm the software engineer on the team. Uh, I'm Ivy, I'm the art engineer on the team. My name is Nolan O'Keefe, and I'm the technology engineer and producer of this team. And I'm Catherine Wheeler, the narrative engineer and assistant producer. We, uh, our project instructors are Ruth Conley and Shirley Saldemarco. We are a faculty pitch project creating a location-based entertainment experience for the ETC Fall Festival on December 9th. The experience will take place primarily in our project room, room 2310, plus four small interactives scattered throughout the building. Our target audience is those attending the festival, which includes families, alumni, and industry professionals. So during our quarters, we presented these three ideas, uh, which are the cookie gnomes, uh, the bee bonanza, and the dragon's exam. These ideas are very different in their interactions, stories, and locations, so that we can get a variety of feedback from different domains. Next slide, please. Uh, from all the feedbacks we got, we think the C3 are the most important. The first thing is that we don't go over scope. The second thing is that we focus on the authenticity of the story and the interactions. The third thing is that a post show throughout the building is a good thing for us to keep. So keeping all these in mind, we now landed on the idea of the Return of the Dragons, which includes large-scale puppetry, uh, fidget-based interactions, and magical elements. So Kat will talk about the narrative and interactions in depth. Thanks, Ivy. Our guest experience takes place primarily in different physical sections of room 2310. We expect that the total length of the experience is between 12 and 15 minutes, but we can accommodate one group of six guests in each, of three, in each three to four minute section. Therefore, our maximum throughput capacity is 96 guests per hour. We'll need three facilitators at these locations. Our guest experience starts with a mage beckoning our guests in from the hallway, telling them that they've been chosen for greatness and giving them precious dragon scales. Next, our guests will move into the first section of our dragon temple. We'll present a pre-show video explaining the backstory which is, in the realm of Eigenrock, dragons and mages used to live in harmony. The bond between them would uh, be used to have dragon scales harness the power of fire, water, and air. But when evil mages attempted to take over the kingdom, dragons were cast out of the realm, and magic faded almost completely. The last dragon eggs were preserved and guarded for ages, but now the elemental guild wants to train new mages and strengthen the magic so that the eggs can be revived. Next, our guests move into a tutorial space that teaches them how to use elemental magic and the dragon scales. They will tap the correct dragon scales on color-coded magic engravings to harness the power of fire, water, and air. Each of these will trigger show elements in the space. Now, our guests understand enough magic to revive the last dragon eggs. Each of them has been preserved in the dragon temple on pedestals for many years, and they need magic to undo this preservation. For example, one egg has been trapped in ice and needs fire magic to melt the ice. One egg has been dried and needs water to rehydrate. And one egg needs the breath of life to be breathed back into it. So the guests will tap the correct scales to perform the magic and revive the eggs. 
When guests bring all three eggs back to life, the eggs are unlocked from their pedestals and the guests can take them with them into the next chamber. Much to their surprise, the power of the dragon eggs being revived was enough to summon a dragon back into this realm. She is terrifying and threatens to destroy the temple. Our guests realize that she was hurt by magic long ago when she was cast out from her land and wants to protect her eggs from the same fate. So they place the eggs back in the nest near her. It's not enough to earn her trust, however. Our guests now have to come back together using their dragon scales and the knowledge that they've gained to harness the power of all three elements and prove to her that the realm is safe once more. When they do, the dragon feels the severed bond between dragons and mages repair. She offers her own dragon scales as a thank you to the mages for restoring dragons to the realm. Using these dragon scales, the guests can interact with post-show scenes placed throughout the ETC building. By tapping the scales they were given, they will activate short animated clips of the three newly hatched dragon eggs playing and flying with their mother dragon, which are projected on the wall nearby the tap point. And now Cleo will talk about the technology in our experience. Thank you, Kat. Our team decided to use RFID technology as the backbone of our interaction for its reliability and stability. We'll be using two different types of RFID for different parts of our experience. For our main experience, which will take place in our project room 2310, we'll be using the RFID fidgets because it can be easily integrated with other fidget peripheral hardwares. And for our post-show station, we'll be using the RC522 RFID module and running on a Raspberry Pi with a mini projector which can form an independent system and we will place them around the building. As you can see on my right hand side, here's a prototype of our um, post-show station. At the end of the experience, each guest will get a dragon skill, which is the RFID, and when they take their dragon skill and tap on the interaction point, it will show a, play a short, short um, animated video showing the, how the dragon ba baby they help hatch is going on and uh, their life with their mother. Aside from the RFID, we'll be using other fidget uh, hardwares and also the control board we'll use and draw uh, Arduino and uh, our Raspberry Pi. And for the physical room effects, we'll be using lighting and a variety of hardware that we consider fitting for the theme of our elemental magic. And also we'll use a TV monitor for the pre-show and the mini projector for the post-show. Next, Ivy will talk about the design. Thanks, Leo. Uh, so when we think about design, the first thing we think about are the magical elements that we're going to use. So finally, we decided on fire, water, and air, which are represented by red, blue, and green color. Uh, so that these colors are the basic colors for the light, and they can be combined into a white color. Uh, next slide, please. And then the magic symbols, which will serve as an interaction point for the visitors. These symbols will be used not only throughout our experience, but also in the post-show. Uh, as some of you might have noticed, we already spread out these symbols inside the building to test the possible locations for our post-show. Next, the dragon design. We got inspiration from the crystal dragon, and we want the dragon to have a crystal horn so that we can shine different light effects on it to show its power and its mood. Uh, we also want the dragon to be white, showing that it can use all kinds of magic and showing that it's not an, an evil dragon. So next, Laurie will talk about the extra production of the dragon and the props. Thanks, Ivy. Now, the largest single set piece of our experience is going to be this massive dragon puppet. And for its design, we explored several existing puppets, especially those from Broadway, musicals including Little Shop of Horrors or the Audrey II puppet, and the dragon from Shrek the Musical. We're also exploring different mechanisms, including four bar lifting mechanisms, pivots, and ball socket joints. Eventually, this kind of exploration led us to our final dragon design, which is going to be a ball socket joint placed just behind the cheek of the dragon's skull as well as a pivot joint so that the dragon can lean forward like a neck mechanism. We also have an eye blinking mechanism so our dragon can blink its eyes closed, which is shown on the, my left on the screen above. Here, the orange arrow represents a pull string that the puppeteer can use in order to close the dragon's eyes. Now, for the set design of our room, we've been working with CMU sophomore Louise Cutter, who is studying scenic design, and she's been helping us immensely with how to lay out our room and how to divide the space. 
We'll be using themed pipe and drape to create the barriers within the room, or each room within a room, that the guests will walk through from stage one all the way through the dragon stage, stage four. For the actual physical elements in the space, we're using a combination of purchased props as well as in-house built props. So the purchased props include things like a water fountain and a cauldron that we're going to use for the elemental interactions, followed by physical props such as these eggs and nest here. Additionally, we are very confident in our prop making abilities such that the, uh, the elements that the guests will interact with most will be able to survive anything that we throw at them. Now for the lighting design, we are talking with Todd Brown, a lighting designer in the drama department at CMU, and we'll be using wall and drape up lights uh, to give a sort of mysterious atmosphere without highlighting any of the imperfections in our scenic design. LED strips for pedestals such that the guests can know when elements are interactable on the pedestals. Uh, we'll be having glowing dragon eyes and crystals to indicate the emotional state of the dragon throughout the final experience. We'll be using point lights to highlight interactables at any point they become interactable, as well as disco-style element lights to represent the magic from each element. And now Nolan will talk about our progress so far. Thank you, Lori. So up until this point in the presentation, we've been talking a lot about where we're at right now, but let's backtrack a little bit and talk about the progress. So. Throughout the semester, we have been going through multiple iterations of a lot of things within our experience. In regards to the story, at one point we had uh, talked about the idea of multiple endings, but we took this idea up to the Hunt Library for one of the playtest nights, playtested it, and it didn't work out. And so we moved on from the idea, and we thought about other ways to evolve our story. We thought about the dragon's personality. Do we want it to be a maternal, or do we want it to be an infernal dragon? And we also thought about uh, the egg and the central like interaction point. At one point, they were going to be crystals, uh, but since we went with a maternal dragon, we thought that the eggs would really fit well into the story. Um, at one point, we were working with Bluetooth wands that had accelerometers built into it, so that when you program them, they can actually read the gestures, and we were hoping to give that uh, next magical element to our experience, but after further testing, we found that there was a lot of connection issues. It would the, how the board was set up, it would disconnect after a couple of minutes, and so we move uh, away from that idea. As you saw from our previous um, slides, the room layout went through multiple iterations uh, with the help of Louise. Um, we figured out on a proper flow for the room uh, that would include a proper queue line and a pre-show, and just in general, going back between different elements and the story in tech. And so we, little big engineers, um, reached out to tiny, huge engineers, um, ETC alumni, Christine Barnes and Daniel Holstein, to really help us kind of take our ideas and really f flesh them out even more. Um, Christine, as you all know, was in last weekend. Uh, she helped our team immensely, kind of help kick off our uh, fabrication phase. Um, next slide. And to briefly go over some of the challenges, um, as an LBE experience, safety is our utmost priority, and so we've been doing a lot to consider safety. Um, in this past week, we had CMU fire marshals into our room where we were testing out smoke effects, if it was effective, um, if the exhaust were effective in our room and removing the smoke, which it is. Um, and then also we can ask them about the pipe and drape and the height limit on there within our room so that we don't block any of the sprinklers. Uh, scope of fabrication as a themed entertainment project, you always want to go big or go home, but we need to still stay manageable so we don't compromise the experience, and so we are considering scope of fabrication as a challenge. Um, audio leakage, um, because we have a lot of pipe and drape and a lot of elements going on in our room, um, we are asking for any advice uh, on audio leakage because we'll have a lot of elements going on, and so there's going to be a lot of bleed between different parts in our room. Hardware testing, like I mentioned earlier, we were testing with Bluetooth wands. Um, we're still looking for a lot of technology to come in so that we can start testing that and get that all checked out before we implement it uh, into our experience. And finally, room furniture storage. Um, we have a lot of things in our room. We got the TV, the desk, the table, the couch. And obviously, the Dragon Temple is not going to have a couch in it. So um, we are looking for any spaces in the ETC to store our furniture the night of, and we are looking for any spaces if anyone has any office space to offer the night of. And finally, uh, we'd like to talk about the schedule briefly. Um, if I may direct your attention to week 11, the whole team is going to IAPA. So we are accounting for it by working over fall break, um, and then our goal, our Big goal is to finish the constructing the experience by week 10, so that when we come back from IAPA, we can hit the ground running from for a bunch of uh, dress rehearsals, tech rehearsals, leading up 
uh, week 14 to the festival, a lot of dress rehearsals so that we can have a good night on December 9th. And so, as we uh, end our presentation, we'd uh, like to give a couple of shout outs. Uh, thank you to Christine Barnes, Daniel Holstein for all your help, Louise Cutter, um, she's just getting part of our team now, but she's really shown a lot of energy, and we love that. Todd Brown, the lighting professor, the ETC IT team, CMU Fire and Safety, Shane Schmidt, Jason Heider, Trevor Mahan, and all the playtesters we've had so far. And in summary, we are little big engineers. We are a LBE experience, um, building a experience for the ETC Fall Festival that focuses on large scale puppetry and RFIDs. Thank you, we are now open for questions. Yes, Ricardo. So um, I really like the way that you guys are dealing with our experience with the dragon. It's different from how I'm, I'm used to thinking about how it would deal with a dragon. How are you going to communicate that to the uh, to 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 your guest? Um, so so the question is about communicating how the guests are meant to interact with the dragon. Um, cool. So um, so that's a really good question because in our original idea we had two endings, one of which the guests could fight the dragon and the other um, where the guests could help the dragon. We found that the fighting the dragon was actually a much weaker ending with the thematic elements that we'd set up before about repairing the trust that went into the magic system that had been offline, faded out for uh, a long time. So we've eliminated the fighting the dragon and we intend to communicate um, the backstory of the dragons not trusting you anymore, both through the pre-show video and through a live actor slash facilitator that's placed in um, the third, that floats between the third and fourth space of the room, between where the eggs get unlocked and where the dragon nest and the dragon puppet are. Yes, Mo. I have a multi-part question. Um, <laughs> The, the majority of what the guest is doing is casting spells, correct? Learning how to cast spells. So how do I cast a spell uh, from a technology point of view? How do you detect that? And then how does the uh, spell manifest? Like what is the reward, uh, the reaction? So the question is, uh, with a, the majority of the interaction is about casting spell, and how the, uh, so how exactly in the technology aspect are we going to do that, and how the magic manifests in the room? So like uh, I uh, so our experience will be mainly based on RFID, and so we're uh, so these kind of dragon skill will be present inside the experience as well, and they will have uh, different kind of elemental magic. And one, once they tap the, to the interaction point on the RFID, so th that will be the um, sp a magic, doing magic action. And how the magic will manifest inside the room is we'll use the lighting effect and uh, the, like the water fountain, the cauldron, and all this stuff that we consider fitting for uh, the theme of the elemental magic and trigger that for the room, meaning that the magic is coming back and triggering all those elements. One of the reasons why we are using fidgets as a main point in our um, experience is that we can easily connect it to a system and really uh, connect it off Unity and then connect the lights off the, um, into Unity and the audio so that like we can control everything. Like So when the RFID is tapped, we can control a lot of things, whether it is a um, connected to a relay that's connected to a soul night how to unlock something and then also you have the lights triggering you have some audio so the fidget technology with combined with the DMX lighting audio um, that will culminate in really good feedback or opportunities for feedback and really getting to the sense of magical elements uh, yes Brenda yeah. okay. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead, Kat. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. So the uh, question was about the big payoff moment of our experience. So we hope that the climactic moment will be our dragon puppet snarling at the guests uh, with fog effects coming out through his mouth that we hoped to demonstrate here, but you can't do that in the RPIS. Um, 
And so a big climactic moment will be the guests feeling like they're in danger from the dragon and then ultimately um, performing the magic that uh, takes that danger away and allows the dragon to actually communicate with them through a voiceover. And the payoff or reward is that our um, RFID scales that will be working with the Raspberry Pis spread throughout the building. Those are something that the guests can take home with them and uh, experience our uh, world even when they're not in our space. Uh, yes, Chris. Do you want a mic, Chris? What? Would you like a mic? Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think we have time for like Jonathan and Jesse. Did you have a question? Uh, I have the same concern as Chris. Okay, okay. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I was just going to ask when you're running multiple groups through this at the same time, how are you going to handle like pacing issues where some groups may take longer or shorter times to do like a puzzle? Is, is there going to be stuff in the environment that they can interact with while they're waiting or some sort of fictional reason that they have to wait? So a large part of this is actually going to be us kind of play testing and then making sure that each experience, like each next experience lasts a little bit less time than the previous experience. Um, so we're hoping for about a four minute, a four minute, three and a half minute, and three minutes so that we can move people through the space. Um, because thematically the first two rooms can be a little bit less, here's where we have to go, here's where we have to go. Whereas bringing the dragon eggs to the dragon is a much more immersion breaking experience if we mistime that. We're planning on having like a little bit less time for each of the experience portions as we progress through the experience. Yeah, and also we have uh, live actors inside most of the room, so they can get control of the time and probably communicate with the guests if they're a little bit over time or they have to wait a little bit of time. Sweet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. No. <laughs> okay. Hi, good morning. We're POV, and this is our half presentation. We're very excited to show you some of what we've been working on today, or not today, <laughs> through the semester so far. Um, I'm Tuesday Becker. I'm the producer. Uh, Xingyi, Chiwen, and Sharon are UI UX, and our programmer is Lucy. So, uh, our faculty instructors are Cheryl and Ruth, and we are working in collaboration with our client, Amatilis, which is also Swipe Video. So, what is Swipe Video? So, Swipe Video allows users to upload any pre recorded footage to create a swipeable video. <clears throat> um, and it can be as little or as many angles as a user wants, and um, basically can use archival footage or modern footage um, and be embedded into a web page. It's kind of similar to this bullet time sequences within the matrix. 
Uh, some of pre previous work by Swipe Video is uh, orchestra performances, historical or um, cultural events. Uh, they've done sports such as volleyball and baseball. They've also done training videos for like cosmetology school, as well as um, using heavy machinery. Uh, so basically, our client came to us and said, you know, we have this technology, but we're coming for you for the creativity. Of creating new ideas on how to use our product. So um, we're basically rapid prototyping and then playtesting. And playtesting for us looks more about like the usability and the feasibility of our ideas. So asking questions like, are these features that we included something that you would use, um, especially over time? Uh, and our final deliverable will be a mix of uh, our private prototypes and um, detailed documentation about our process, any challenges we faced, as well as um, possible demographics or ways that we could um, further develop our ideas. So we got a lot of great ideas from quarters and we've either in involved them with our current prototypes or are part of our plan for after uh, halves. Uh, we've done 13 prototypes so far, and um, we're hoping to get to about 20 by the end of the semester. So these are a couple examples on how we can use swipe video. So the first is a 360 example. Thank you, Nolan, for being our actor. Uh, he stood in the center, and they had eight cameras around him, so there'd be eight different viewpoints. Uh, our second example is an example of using archival footage and modern footage to kind of show historical change over time of the same um, landmark, which is Shuntley Fountain. And the third uh, was BBW. We got to capture some of the worlds of this last final. Thank you, Dave. Um, and we recorded uh, him playing through a BBW world, as well as uh, recording the screen to see what he was actively seeing. So you're able to swipe between uh, the anxious BBW team the uh, Dave playing through the world, as well as the, uh, what he was seeing um, in the headset. So we had three categories. Uh, we, rough, we brainstormed around 45 different ideas, and they each fell under these three categories of social education and entertainment. Uh, so um, we're hoping, like I said before, to get to about 20 prototypes um, past halves. So yes, uh, Sharon will talk a little bit more. Um, so the first uh, challenge that we have is what features could we introduce that would improve the user experience. And the first prototype that we did is called the player map. Uh, we found out the existing concert recording did not provide any control over the angle towards the concert uh, footage. And Swipe Video did a project to deal with this problem as shown in the right. However, uh, the user still couldn't get a picture of what the concert looks like and they're hard to locate the particular uh, musician and department. To solve this problem, we designed a website for the concert promoter to build an interactive map, and also we designed an app for the audience to watch the concert from certain angle, and by swiping or come back to the map again, they can switch the wheel. However, we found out um, the concert promoter is hard to change the map every time that the seating chart changed. So instead of apply this platform into the concert activity, we can apply this form uh, this platform to the sports activities such as tennis or table tennis. And the second prototype that we did is called the theater map. We found out the audiences uh, sometimes couldn't get the seats they want, so that it caused them to have like a bad viewing position. And um, they want to see more details about a performance from different angles. And also the performers want to get the appreciation of the effort that they took for the show. To deal with this problem, we designed a platform for the users to swipe to see the videos taken by different audiences in different sections um, with 3D, 3D theater model on the side. They can see more details of the performers and also uh, what's going on in the backstage. Uh, during the usability testing, we found out a lot of people are really interested with this idea, so we plan to uh, interview more people who actually work in the theater, and also we want to uh, visit Roots Theater to take some videos of the actual performance. So the second challenge that we are focusing on is how could swipe video be used on social media? And um, 
in the existing uh, social media app, uh, people can only see the limited angle of a video. And uh, because of that, they lack the freedom of watching whatever the point of view they want to see, and also lost a lot of important information. Uh, for the creators, they need to spend more time on figuring out what kind of content they need to create to uh, promote themselves. Uh, for the solution, we want the users to make their own decision on uh, whether to watch a swipeable video or a normal video, and uh, by giving them the videos with, dif with different points of view, they can have immersive experience. Uh, we designed a portal for, them, uh, for the users to efficiently upload simultaneous video taken from different angles, and then the platform will help them to automatically generate a swipeable video. Uh, because we're worried about the copyright problem, uh, instead of adding a new feature to an existing app, we plan to create a proof of the concept that can be used by any social media app. Uh, another prototype we did is to redesign the swipe video camera. SV Cam is an iOS app iOS app that allows multiple users to shoot videos synchronously, and one person needs to control the start and stop button. And uh, we play tested this uh, app in our trip to a lantern festival, and we figured some problems with it. First, this app is not designed for a team with multiple users. And secondly, there's no design features for us to shoot uh, through 360 videos. And also, uh, many functions are not organized in a very user-friendly way. So we figured uh, we have our solutions to be summarized in the following points. Firstly, we've added an initial setting to determine who's the account, uh, account manager and who's the participant. Also, we've added a camera list and a labeling feature for better team working. And we've also redesigned the entire user experience. And the takeaway from this is that if the swipe video part wants to uh, expand their demographic, using SVCam to shoot videos synchronously could be very commonly used in the future. And uh, it is important to let users to know uh, what to do with this app and how to use it. The next part is to figure out how we can use swipe video for educational purpose. And the, the, next, uh, the first prototype we did is called Swipe History. Essentially, our idea is to create content and, and platform to this, uh, for historical landmarks, merging archival and modern footages. Our solution is to create a website that, allow, uh, that displays uh, historical landmarks on the map, and you can click into one of those, and you can see the swipe video content, read in introductions, and mark likes to the video, and leave comments. And the, the takeaway from this is that if we want to further develop this, we will try to discover and capture more Pittsburgh history, and we will also try to use the same angle footages in order to make the video more impactful. And next we have Steven to talk about more ideas. So our team also explored the possibility to incorporate educational game with swipe video technology. Um, our goal is to teach kids around grade three about 3D thinking and also teach them some basic knowledge of the objects. So in this design concept, we want to let the children to swipe the video and also collaborate to uh, find the given objects and complete the task. Um, so here is a screenshot of the prototype. Um, in this game, uh, the first kids are going to watch a video, a swipeable video of the forest uh, in daylight, and the other uh, kids are going to watch the same forest but in night. Um, so two kids are going to communicate and count how many animals there are in total in the forest. Um, the takeaway of this idea is that the demography can be varied depending on the difficulty of the question. The question can be easy as how many animals there are in total in the forest, or it can be how many, animals, uh, how many mammals there are in the forest. Our next idea is that we want to try to incorporate um, swipe video technology with art exhibition. After interviewing some museum visitors, we summarized their pain points. Um, for in-person museum visitors, um, the crowded people and the limitation of how the artwork are installed make them have less time and opportunity to enjoy the arts. And for the uh, online visitors, the art pieces such as sound arts or dynamic installation do not really have a lot of information. They only show as an image with some task description. 
So to deal with these problems, we want to use swipe video technology to create a swipeable video of the artworks. So after the museum, a museum staff or art artists themselves pre-record some video of the artworks and upload it to swipe video websites, they can get a QR code and a HTML link so that they can further just embed it to their website or print the QR code out and paste it next to the artworks. And our next step is to reach out to CMU Art Department to do a usability test with our students there. So the next question that our prototype is trying to answer is how can we use swipe video to help creators with limited budget? So as we all know, like motion capture is quite a costly process. So we want to use swipe video to do the motion capture for the people with limited budget. So the detailed plan is that uh, since the swipe video have a functionality of providing the biometric information of the video, so we want to use uh, iPhone depth camera to serve as a scanner. So in this way, incorporating with the biometric information, we can achieve a relatively more like cheaper motion capture process. So the detailed, detailed steps are this. Firstly, we'll extract the iPhone steps information, and then we are adding the green screen to only keep the point that we want in a mesh. And then we'll use algorithm to project back those points back into 3D space. And then like we'll like make assertion that points on the depth camera that are neighbor to each other are like the points on the neighbor in the real world. So we'll do the connection back and like regenerating mesh in this way. So the takeaway for this is that we Maybe in the future, if we can like further develop this prototype, we'll use a real depth camera because like we find out there are distortions, like distance distortions in the iPhone camera, and also like the uh, the like conversion to the real world distance is lost, like when the photo photos are exported to the computer. So like with the real depth camera, we can improve the pos position accuracy and also help us to stitch those photos together so we can have a better mesh. Uh, this. The game plan after the halves, we will like keep exploring the three categories that we have already have, uh, like their social entertainment and education. We will like further improve the prototypes and based on the client's feedback, and we will also like further develop the documentation for those prototypes with like interviewing professionals and other teams for for like more information in those. And this is the presentation, and we are taking questions. Thank you. So you have so many prototypes here. What is, what is your actual final deliverable going to look like? Is it just going to be a book of all these things that you tried? Or what are, are you trying to unify a bunch of these ideas together and move forward? Yeah, so it'll be a final like document with all the ideas kind of underneath each of the categories. We wanted to provide a variety of concepts that Swipe Video can then take and maybe pursue. So that's mostly, we want to just provide variety. Um, yes. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You don't have a little bit. Okay. Yeah, so I, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to ask, but I'm going to give it a <laughs> So with Swipe Video, one of the issues I've always had Why do I want to see the back of someone's head? Mm. Why is that important? I'm not asking you to answer that question. I, I always wonder that myself. So it seems to me that, um, that it may not work well in certain situations because of that. Because who wants to see you behind something? You know, I don't know. Maybe some people do. It seems to me it would work better for um, things also, like you mentioned, maybe you said this, and maybe I missed it, in the educational part of your where you have like a machine or something that, something that's working, a, a piece of equipment that you could go around it and actually, for an educational purpose, break it down to see how it may work, whatever that may be for whatever age group that, or engineers or scientists, whatever. So um, that, again, it's not a question, but um, yeah, it's, it's all my mind. Yeah, I mean, so swipe video can be used for 360, which that's a very good use of it is, you know, that was something that Mike had brought up during quarters is like, what do you want to capture that's supposed to be seen from 
all those angles, right? You don't want to see the back of someone's head. It's not as interesting, right? Um, but you can also use it for just completely different angles, different shots completely. So it doesn't just have to be 360. So for example, like if you're in the orchestra, they have like um, the basis or whatever right here, the camera is facing them and then a camera facing someone else completely. So it doesn't just have to be like the 360 view, which means that um, you can easily swipe between different viewpoints, um, but it doesn't have to just focus on uh, one subject. Uh, so yeah, but that's something that we did think about um, as far as like what would actually be interesting to see and capture like uh, art out in the world that's supposed to be seen from you know all all angles. Yeah. And one more question. Mm -hmm. like in a, in a, if you had two people or three people in a dramatic situation, mm -hmm. say a theater and a round table, mm -hmm. I could see that working in that sense because it's almost like cutting from over the shoulder to someone else's over the shoulder. Right. One point of view, point of view. Have you tried that? So we haven't tried that yet, but we're that's part of our plans for is to actually shoot like theater, uh, like live like performance. Um, one thing that we did think about was shooting like uh, having uh, footage of, you know, the tech person on the thing and being able to see well, like what they're doing during the performance as well as like the backstage, like the actors rushing around, like chaos that's happening back there, as well as the performance at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, have you guys um, looked at stealing a trick from typical video editing, like using transitions, or does this not really support um, you know transitions? They're a lot of fun to play with, and for me, it's one of the joys of editing something is figuring that out. So, you know, have, is that something that you guys have thought about? Oh, oh um, tr like so transitions. We haven't really thought about it so far. Uh, we only really have access to the front end, um, which is just the video player, but that is something I think that we could look into. That's a good idea for transitions, yeah, between the clips. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, based on either what you've already done or what you are gonna be doing, which idea so far is the most exciting to the team? That's so hard because we all like you know have a part in each of the projects, and there's such a variety of things, and we all have different interests. So it's just hard to collectively choose one idea, uh, which I think is partially why we've done so many different prototypes. Uh, yeah, that's a good question, though. I think the clients will probably like vote for a prototype like after half, then we'll like dive into that. Type one more. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm late. Okay. So, um, what, what then? What do you expect at the end of the semester? Do you expect to deliver? What, what's your deliverable? Five, six, ten, fifteen, twenty prototypes. Yeah, so we're aiming to have 20 prototypes. Um, these included, these are eight so far, but we have 13, um, including like the, the, the actual prototypes themselves as long, along with the detailed documentation. But we're also going to interview some of the professionals and then take that uh, feedback that we get at like those play tests and usability tests, as well as um, I actually made a, scheduled an appointment with uh, y'all's, uh, the La Mama team to like kind of get, do a brainstorm session with them and kind of see like, you know, put that into the documentation as well. Thank you, right. Thank you guys so much. All right, welcome everybody. My name, oh, we are Building Blocks. My name is Jillian. This is Anlan and Cheng Wang, Xiao, Rohit, and Lin. 
So our client this semester is Genevieve Johnson at Roblox. She's an instructional designer for Roblox, particularly in, in game-based learning. She gave us the um, task to design a prototype of a narrative design tool in Roblox Studio. So before getting into what exactly this means, I want to talk a little bit about what Roblox and Roblox Studio is. So Roblox is a platform where users can play and share experiences. The user base generally ranges from 7 to 18 years old. And then Roblox Studio is the editor that is connected to Roblox. So this essentially contains an asset library and uses Lua so that it's a little easier for like, young developers to get into making experiences for Roblox. So what Roblox wanted us to do is create a learning tool with branching narratives to teach traditional school subjects. So this includes the ability to have asset placement in a 3D environment, includes exclusive sharing, meaning that a, only a classroom has access to a certain world as to not violate any like, privacy concerns of the classroom. This is all happening in Roblox and is a cross-platform cross um, event, meaning that it can be used on mobile or on um, a PC with Chromebooks, whatever. And then also it's scalable across, subject, across various school subjects. So our target audience for this is kind of twofold. Um, on one hand, it's high school students who are 13 to 18 years old with like little to no coding experience. But because our tool will not actually be seeing high schoolers, it's kind of more for Roblox educational designers to draw inspiration from and learn from. Um, what this means is that our deliverables are kind of complex. So on one hand, we're creating this narrative playground tool, but we're also creating a, a test story or a demonstration of how this tool could work. And this would necessarily be like an example of what a high school student might provide to a teacher given an assignment to do something in Roblox. In addition to that, we're providing documentation about the next, step, next steps, challenges, and any sort of guidelines we can give to Roblox. So to kind of come across our ideas for this, we decided to work backwards using our, a test story or demonstration. Um, we chose a subject that hit Roblox's three goals, which is that it uh, was an, a history literature subject taught in high schools and allowed for multiple perspectives. Um, we ended up choosing the Homestead Strike because it's taught to 10th and 11th graders, um, has a wide variety of really diverse and polarized perspectives. And then in addition to that, it's something that involves a lot of local Pittsburgh history and is relevant to the current, current economic climate with the um, labor movement that's currently going on. So to go a little more in depth about this, I'm going to pass it off to Xiao. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so talking about our test story, um, so, we, so, so we want the player to take the perspective uh, from the assistant of Henry Frick, and Henry Frick was uh, the chairman of Carnegie Steel, and there was a disagreement on labor wages between the labor union and Carnegie Steel. And player will be given the task to help uh, Henry Frick uh, to prevent labor wages from increasing. So how are we going to implement this? So we, we, we chose to use Quest um, to get the story going. And we are doing this for several reasons. Uh, first, branching narrative can get really messy really quickly. Um, so I, we think it's easier to keep track of if we use um, Quest. And it's also easier for state tracking because it, using Quest is more linear. And we think that Quest works really well in a 3D space because player will be talking to an NPC and they will get the Quest that will send them to the next part of the story. So what is the conversation with each NPC going to look like? For this part, the conversation will be uh, tries based. So player will get different prompts and they can uh, gather different informations. And the student who designed the story can demonstrate their understanding of the event by writing the story and the dialogues. Uh, so, we, so we have been trying to make the story using our current system and this is what we have. See, there's a proximity prompt when players close to an NPC, and they will be given dialogue choices. And when the dialogue is over, they got a quest that sent them to the next NPC. And this is our 
uh, gameplay loop. Uh, additionally, we have also been doing uh, prototyping with other narrative design tools, and we, we've listed uh, the features that we like, and we are trying to narrow them down, and this is how we get our uh, core features that we want to pursue. And we're uh, especially inspired by Sport Galactic Adventures for its SHR and its dialogue system. Um, so this is how we kind of reverse engineered and uh, got our key features. And now I'm going to pass it on to Chen Guang to talk about them. Yeah, thank you, Xiao. Uh, so based on the researches and our test story, we have finalized these features to make our tools more uh, flexible across subjects and more easily usable by high school students. And the above three are the exploratory features that are not things typically seen in current Roblox experience, but are of crucial importance to build our branching narrative. And the first and foremost one is the dialogue system. It is a basic of every branching narrative. So we decided to abandon the building uh, Roblox dialogue system because it is highly connected with Roblox Studio and requires coding experience and is fixed to developers, not students. It also has intuitive, not intuitive building procedures because all the dialogue scripts are lying in the hierarchy in the Roblox Studio. So instead, we are building our own data structure, which is a node graph, to support the code-free narrative building. So as we can see, a typical dialogue in the branching narrative contains multiple choices, and each of the choices will bring us to a branch that triggers different events and so that the pro so story will proceed. And this is what we currently have. We have create and connect dialogue nodes using the script, and we have proximity prompt, which was shown in the demo. Uh, we can walk into an NPC, and the NPC will react to us. And also, our dialogue system uh, allows customized events, such as the NPC will give the player some items or change their state numerical, numericals as well. Uh, and the features we are currently implementing is also the, the global status tracking. Uh, so the global status is a word state or a variable stored in a shared area that every NPC or players can access to. And this allows the creation of more advanced narrative branching. For example, in our test story, our player need to interact with Carnegie before they can go to Frick. So uh, there's a variable store that, that can be detected by, by the other, another NPC uh, to detect whether he has interacted with or not. And this also allows task tracking such as the quest log. Now I will pass it to Rohit to talk about the exclusive sharing and world building. Thank you, Chengwang. So one of the things that our client really wanted was exclusive sharing, because anything you share in Roblox is automatically shared with everybody. So uh, we came up with the idea of embedding the sharing ability inside the game. So we have this concept, concept of plots, where every plot is unclaimed. And each player can sort of claim the plot, and that plot will belong to them. So they can create their experiences in that, in that plot itself, and not outside it. So as you can see, uh, they can only create uh, in their plot, and they cannot even make changes to other people's experiences. But So this allowed us to keep the plot specific to the players, and also uh, made sure that other students can enjoy and play other students' experiences. So coming back to the features, we have two more features that we thought were really integral to uh, our tool. Uh, saving and loading is something that really we really wanted, because uh, uh, we wanted the players to come back to the experience and keep building on it and share it with other people as well. So this was a no-brainer for us. And the second was definitely the asset drawer. And like Jill mentioned, uh, in our prototyping phase, we sort of realized why we needed this. It was mostly uh, for world building and placing props and characters and enabling the students to create their own uh, personalized experience. And the inspiration was, again, uh, Spore's Galactic Adventures. And we also looked at other tycoon games that had the drag and drop system, so we could get inspired from that. And let's talk about some of the properties of the asset drawer. Uh, firstly, we have an asset gallery, which will have different categories like um, characters, props, and environment. Um, a simple placing system, uh, you can just move around your cursor, and it'll have a highlight, and you can just place it. 
Um, and we also have the assisting ability to rotate and place objects. Along with that, for, to provide for iterations, we have the delete features as well. Um, we also did a survey and paper prototyping recently with six of the high school students where we pre presented them with, a, with an assignment and we sort of introduced them to a dialogue tree and asked them to make their own. Uh, and we, and in addition to this, we also contacted uh, teachers for, across different subjects to get to know what kind of assignment they would want to give. So some of the takeaways that we had from this playtesting session was uh, students really appreciate having a template to follow. As they, are not, as they are not narrative designers, it was good to have a reference for them to start from. Uh, they valued placing assets highly. Uh, they also uh, wanted to pre-plan the story before jumping into Roblox. And finally, they would uh, want to make these experiences for language subjects and science subjects. So these, this playtest sort of uh, solidified and reinforced the UX chart that we already had, which was researching, uh, then moving to uh, mapping out the story, then jumping to Roblox, creating the experience, then playing with the dialogue tree and the node graph to make their own dialogue and storyline, and finally chatting with the students and teachers so that they can uh, talk about it. Uh, now I would like to call upon Alan to talk about the art. Okay, thank you, Rohit. And uh, here is our, our target for this project. We are planning to provide an art gallery with a bunch of art assets for our user to choose to use in their narrative design. And here are some of our reference. And also, uh, this is our design issue from our art asset. Uh, we are planning to uh, provide a template with uh, some relative environment setting uh, for our user to uh, choose because our tools are designed for the high school student as an assignment since uh, so we don't want to make it too heavy or difficult for them to start. Uh, like you can see in the picture on the left, uh, here's the uh, like the sample template we built for our demo story. We already have the factory, boat, and bridge here, which is all the key feature for our demo story. So with this kind of template, uh, our user can build uh, or edit based on that. So that will be much easier for them to start. And based on that, we still uh, provide a single asset in our drawer. So our user can uh, like either drag and drop whatever they want, like the environment, character, or props into their own narrative design. So we still provide lots of freedom. And also, to, uh, we want to feed like different kind of stories, so we might uh, need both indoor and outdoor scene. So uh, for this issue, we are thinking about maybe we can reduce part of the outside wall uh, so we can see the inner part directly. And uh, in this way, all the things can happen on the one plot. So that will make our experience smooth and also reasonable for our like, uh, workload. So I will pass to Lian to talk about more of our progress. Yeah, uh, so before we start, we have tested implementing the R asset into Roblox Studio. And based on some li limitations, we have settled our R style to this kind of a this simple and low poly way. And for I'll quickly go through the art process we have. We have created art list for the environment part, like you can see the bridge, the boat, and the factory and also some generic models like the townhouses, which are all based on our historical topic and story. And here's a character and prop list and progress we have created. And so in summary, we are creating a narrative playground tool target for high school students. We're going to present a demo showing how this tool can, could be used and documentation on the next step, challenges, and guidelines. And thanks for listening, and we're open to questions. Yeah, Jesse. What playtesting have you done so far? So, um, what we've done is we went to a uh, Cornell High School, which is outside of Pittsburgh, and we had a survey for them to fill out about how they would use a Roblox assignment and maybe how they would go about it, and then their interest in using those um, an assignment like this for various like uh, classes, and then we had them create paper prototypes of dialogue trees. Um, so these, we ch let them choose their own like favorite media or story to write their own dialogue tree from, and we gave them a template as an example, and we were just kind of gauging how complex they could make a guy dialogue tree or if it was particularly overwhelming or anything like that. Ralph. And I don't 
hear, I didn't hear any of that in there. And you're dealing with a subject that's really a, a pretty sensitive subject, you know, really historically speaking of union busting. Uh, so my impression was I'm a, I'm a, I, I need, as an administrator, I need to try to get the workers less money. Is that, is that my idea of this? And I guess that's number one. And the, question, the other question is, have you talked to any labor negotiators or conflict mediators about how you deal with this sort of negotiation? So um, our plan is to create the same story from different perspectives. So the one that we are working on, uh, the player is playing the assistant of Henry Freak and is kind of like a fictional character, is a difficult position to be in. So in the dialogue, there will be some like more challenging stuff. So you're like, you work for the guy who is essentially pretty bad, but there will be moments that like, oh, do you, do you help him or do you kind of like not help him? So it's kind of thought provoking in that way. And then we do plan, we do plan on making another um, story, same story from the worker's perspective. And uh, we, we haven't talked to um, any like labor union leader, but I think that's a very good thought that we may go deeper into. Uh, why do we want to use Roblox as a learning tool, and how has that informed your approach and design? So Roblox is an interesting platform because it is in 3D, and it can be, you can essentially build anything on it, making it incredibly flexible. So the platform itself is kind of scalable for whatever you need it to be. Um, maybe the idea is that you would use Roblox in place of an essay or a short story, so to speak, so that players could demonstrate what they've learned by either creating their own story or kind of repeating what they know is happening in history. And in our case, we really want to force like role taking for the players, since as a player, you're going around and you are talking to NPCs, in addition to actually having built them out. It seems like for this one, you guys are really focusing on using branching narrative for history. Um, are you targeting your entire semester to just looking at that? Or I know you mentioned multiple subjects. Um, how is you know, how is this going to be different for another subject? Or are you guys going laser beam on this? Yeah. So for this semester with our, the like test story, we are kind of focusing in on, in on history, but we have interviews set up with teachers over the next couple of weeks across multiple subjects to talk about how this um, tool could be used in their own classrooms, in their own subjects. Um, one teacher that is really interested in this is a foreign language teacher. And so she is interested in it because it'd be a great chance for students to like practice creating dialogue in another language. We are just um, zoning in on history because the client has asked us to pick history or literature, and history offers a lot in, variety, in perspective taking. So uh, in my experience, one of the fun parts of teaching history is complicating kind of existing simplistic understandings of historical events. And Roblox sort of lends itself towards a sort of iconic simplification of history in a way because of through its design style. And I mean, you're going to have everybody out in the street rather than inside buildings and that sort of stuff. Is there a way that you can use this kind of iconic design style to still complicate um, overly simplistic understandings of complex historical events? Um, I, th I think so because our, so our main storyline does closely follow the actual history. Mm -hmm. um, it's just the character that player takes on is fictional and we kind of write some, we, we write the dialogues. So we do think that is, it does follow the like compli complicated, the complicated history. Um, yeah, it's just the environment and the style that's 
simplified. And additionally, because this is going to be sent off to Roblox in particular, if we, that is something that we are struggling with or we think we need to zone in on more, it's an import, that is an important next step that we could talk about as well in our documentation for Roblox. Because one thing that they have access to is a lot of people to make lots of assets and kind of create a really strong foundation for those complications in the future. Awesome, thank you guys. All right, um, welcome to our first half presentation. We are Team Games for All. And our target is creating a more accessible and challenging game experiments. So here is our instructor, Hazel Kelly, and we also have two consultants from EA, Kate and Morgan. These are our teammate, uh, team members. We have Wei Ling, Nelson, Glendon, Jerry, and I'm Dennis. So our project goal is exploring accessible game design pattern to enable a stronger sense of empowerment and inclusion for players with most likely mobility disability. And for our matrix metrics, we have documentation of proposals, play testing in different phases, and regular game prototypes. Later, we will give more explanations on these. And next, I will, uh, William will introduce the overview of the background. Thank you, Dennis. So I'll um, introduce the background briefly. So um, disabled players want to have the same kind of fun and uh, game experience as non-disabled players. But currently, there are some um, design mismatches between players' ability and their game control schemes. Uh, those are barriers keeping the players from the desired uh, game experience they wanted. Uh, but so the current solution um, is are expl explicit accessible features uh, like game offers some um, accessibility option menus and implicit accessible features like good visual audio and uh, visual feedback, menu navigation, game navigation, and etc. So here are some of the common design mismatches uh, that exist in game. Uh, movements, timed gameplay, complex control, physical fatigue, and sensitivity. We try to address those um, common design mismatches to benefit not only the permanent disabled players, but also situational and temporary disabled players, as well as um, non-disabled players. For example, the um, caption function is developed originally for people with deafness, but actually more players actually benefit from this function. Um, so here's an uh, here's a example of Ring Fit Adventure. Uh, so this is kind of the current solution to the accessibility issue in games. So here you can see this game uh, offers uh, the assist, assist mode. So if you turn on this mode, instead of doing those uh, exercises, you can actually push a button uh, and instead of like doing shoulder or back or ab and knee uh, uh, exercises, if you uh, turn on knee assist, you, you just push the button on the controller instead of jogging in place or doing any of the leg uh, exercises. But when we were talking about this, this example to our instructor, Heather, uh, she, she has already played the game, but she actually doesn't even know this um, menu existed in the game. So that's one of the problem because this uh, accessibility option menu is hidden so deeply in those, all those UI menus. And also it's kind of hard to understand. Uh, here's another example of Ghostwire Tokyo. So here the players are supposed to trace this, uh, comp this shape using the left joystick, but player can also choose to just skip this challenge completely. So this is kind of a common solution in the game industry. So we have, um, there are still like, problems of the current solution. The first is 
is the game accessible enough? So it's still a hassle to map the buttons to different hardwares. And the second problem is, is the game challenging enough? So there's a thin line between accessible and challenging. Sometimes the developers just make their game too easy for, for if you turn the accessibility mode on. Um, so we want to propose our solution to embed accessibility in early design stage. Uh, which contains two parts. The first part is um, adaptive difficulty by personalizing the challenge according to player's capability. And the second part is intuitive game control by auto-mapping controls according to the player's practice. So how are we going to achieve those two goals? Here we have two methods. The first method is to use collaboration as a tool to adjust the challenge level, thus making the game more accessible. And the second method is to intermix the button mapping process into the game tutorial level, and thus making the game more accessible. So for now, we have uh, almost completed the first method. Uh, we showed our uh, solutions and our game demo to EA Positive Play Group, and their feedback is doing button mapping via a collaboration intro level is a novel idea, and they are interested to see if and how it will be fun. Very cool area for exploration to find out. Uh, then I'll let Jerry to uh, explain more about our collaboration process. Thanks, Willing. So we use the idea of predictive modeling when building this calibration model, and um, that consists of two part, uh, two phases: the game phase, uh, the data phase, and the game phase. So the data phase is a play testing phase where we collect data from the players and we an analyze the data and then uh, establish a prediction model based on it. And to achieve that, we further divide the data phase into two parts. In part A we monitor a set of players' behaviors and uh, uh, quantify them into meaningful data. Let's call it X. And whereas in part B, we ask players to complete a standardized task, and we record the score Y as a measurement for their game ability. And at last, we um, use mathematical data feeding to formulate a, a, a prediction model so that a uh, prediction model F, so that Fx approaches y. And this model will then be used in the game phase. The game starts with a calibration level, and during that, um, the game will uh, also collect players' data and record the performance, and then feeding the data into the prediction model to predict his or her ability for the game. And then we will adjust the level of challenge according to their predicted scores and the detailed data. And we decided to make a Unreal Shooter game as a pro prototype for this calibration model. And we aim at age 12 plus and specifically includes people with upper body motor mobility conditions. And the main challenge for the game will be the accuracy of control. So um, given that, we designed the data phase. Um, we designed an FPS-like setting for the data phase in part A. Players are asked to shoot randomly generated targets within 30 seconds, and um, the targets generate with uh, half a second interval and will disappear after two seconds. And then in part B, they're also given 30 seconds to shoot as many targets as they can, but this time, new targets only generate after, after the last target is destroyed. We count the total number of all the hit targets as a score for part B, and then we create the prediction model based on it. And then, in the game phase, the game, uh, the calibration level, uh, also known as the tutorial level, will also collect the data, predict, the, uh, predict their ability in runtime, and then dynamically change the level of challenge. We have already conducted our first rounds of playtesting for the data phase. We've collected a lot of data, and among them, we found some are related to um, the player's ability for the game. So we incorporated these factors into the prediction model, and that includes the maximum, head, uh, the maximum time interval between two heads, the average lifetime of all the head targets, and um, the head target number as a percentage to all the target number, and the head accuracy of the player. These, uh, this table contains the 
all the data that we've collect, collected, and 75% of the data are taken as the, um, the test set. We analyze it and uh, create the prediction model based on them, and then apply the model to the rest 25% of the data, the validation set to validate the model's effectiveness. And this plot sh uh, demonstrates the comparison between the prediction results and the actual scores. The orange dots are the estimated scores and the blue ones are the actual scores. We found this result quite satisfying and that proves the validity of our method. The next, Nelson is going to talk about some design details. Thank you. So as we mentioned before, our main fo uh, challenge focus for this prototype is going to be accuracy, specifically the player's ability to emit target. And for that reason, we found movement could be an interference with player's ability to actually emit target. So that's why we go with the on-rail shooter, where the movement will be controlled so uh, we can get more accurate data. So in our game, the player will move in a predetermined path and shoot on target along the way. And the theme will going to be a Western theme with uh, we're going to follow an RSVB rating of everyone to include more players. Uh, aside from target you can shoot along the road, there will be interest point where the player stop their movement and then shoot in a stationary position. Uh, we do this because it's more similar to our calibration setting. So these interest points are specifically de uh, designed to get more accurate data to evaluate our results. We also have three kinds of target in our game. The first one is stationary, where it stays in the scene until it gets hit. The second one is time, where it pops up and disappears after a set amount of time. And the third one is a moving target, which is harder to aim at. Uh, our design do not expect the player to hit all the targets, so adding more variety of target can challenge the player even more and then encourage them to get good. Kind of. uh, now I'll talk about the relationship between the challenge of the game and the skill of the player. So if the challenge is too high for the player's skill, it gets boring, it, get, it leads to anxiety, but the other way around, it gets boring. So what we're trying to do is we want to keep the dynamic range of keeping the experience in the ch uh, flow channel indicated in the graph. So our calibration process is measuring the player's skill in the bottom here, and according to that result, we can dynamically change the challenge uh, in that uh, chart upright. And then we are going to do that through three accessibility options. The first one is M Assist, where if a, pl a player's crosshair is near a target, it auto locks the M here t to the center of the target to assist the aim action. And the second one is changing the target size, where the bigger the target is, it's easier to aim at. And the third one is movement speed. Uh, this, for the moving target, if the target is slower, it's obviously easier to aim at. So with these three accessibility options, we can make the challenge level appropriate to uh, different players to ensure a uh, good experience. And here are some of our, our details. We're going for a cartoony, uh, child-friendly look. And next, I'll introduce Glenn to talk about our deliverables. Thanks, Nielsen. So for our final deliverable, we will first have our accessible game design proposals, and the second, we'll have the game production documentation as our huge step. And for third, we will have two to three prototypes. For the first one, we will have the calibration, and second will be the auto button mapping. For the third one, we are searching for some opportunity that we can combine these two as a whole. So for the design and the and process, we have a lot of difficulty and challenges. The first one is that it is so hard for us to find specialized play testers. And the second is that we may find it is difficult for us to get some certain hardware, such as Zip and Puff. For solve these problems, we have reached out to some local organizations or specialists. We have visited the Intermediate Unit 1, a local K-12 educational organization, and they have the special kind of the disability uh, support classroom. We have visited them and get the best touch of their gameplay, of their hardwares, and of their daily routine. Also, we have talked to Patrick from HCI. Patrick is a specialist in accessibility and disability. He inspired us some potential way of conducting our play testing and find more play testers. We, also, we are also conducting with some local organizations such as Able Gamers. So to search for some potential play testers and some potential collaboration. 
So right now we have two potential solutions. The first one is that we are going to conduct our play testing remotely. And the second is that we may, we, we may need to make our play testers wider, such as we may include the people with temporary or situational disability. So for our next steps, first we'll continue to iterate on our first prototype, and second we're gonna contact potential play testers to conduct our play testing. And third, we will de continue to design and develop the button mapping level. So here is the basic timeline we are keeping on track. And I'd love to invite all my teammates back to stage. So in all, we are games for all, and we are creating a more accessible and challenging game experience for everyone. Thanks. So we are open to questions. The reason that adaptive difficulty is generally avoided is that it makes the game too easy in most cases because if you want to beat the game, you just need to play badly for a little while and then the game gets easy and then you beat it. So how, how do you propose to overcome that with an adaptive difficulty system? So um, we're not try. Uh, we discuss this, and we don't want to uh, tell the player that there is actually a calibration process. So they don't kind of know that there is a dynamic change of difficulty until they like kind of find out after trying several times. So for the first uh, several playthrough, obviously the player will to try to aim for higher scores. So that we are expecting them to like reach their actual capacity in playing the game uh, in the first play through, uh, first playthrough. Okay, thanks. Um, is your model able to tell whether or not you're dealing with a mobility issue or with a skill difference? For instance, in your shooting game, you're saying uh, there's somebody with upper body mobility. And correct me if any of this is wrong. Um, you're saying that someone with upper body mobility can't hit the targets as fast. But what if that's, I mean, is that a, what if I'm dealing with per, with a perception issue? What if I'm just not good at shooters? Uh, how are you differentiating between that? Or is that outside of your scope? Um, so since uh, we don't want to categorize people, and then, uh, for example, maybe someone who used to play shooter games in the mouth would get like worse when playing with the controller. And some dis uh, player with upper body disabilities can like use their controllers better than maybe me playing with the controller. So I'm, uh, we're just trying to abstract the different player's physical ability or pl uh, like playing ability to their ability to complete game tasks and game actions. So that, that is all within the scope. And for perception issues, so the first prototype, we're just going to focus on accuracy. So that's not taken into consideration. But in further prototypes, maybe we can take, like, we can focus on the main challenge of like hand-eye coordination, where perception is a huge like challenge for them, and then we can like make a prototype specific to that. We're not considering all the uh, all the difficulties right now because of the scope. So one prototype will only focus on one challenge for the player, and for the first one, it's going to be accuracy. Hey, I was interested in your choice of essentially making a one stick shooter because I think two stick shooters are probably the least accessible and then one stick and then no stick shooters like Time Crisis or something arcade game where you just move the thing and shoot at it. Is there a reason why you chose one stick and in relation to this particular audience? Uh, it's because uh, in our calibration level, there is only an enemy motion without a movement motion, so we don't find like moving necessary yeah. and so by taking that calibration process into the actual game design, uh, we don't. We also don't want like movement to interfere with like the actual shooting and aiming motion to like interfere with our result. Mm -hmm. So taking a controlled movement will fix that. So uh, we don't need another like joystick to control the movement. So we're just going to go for one stick. You mentioned accessing your audience is a difficult part of this project. 
Um, have you found ways to just engage with them as opposed to not just play testing? Like play testing is a big ask, like so seeing I'm playing a game, but have you found ways to get you know, input on what your audience perceives as the biggest challenges in games, what they would like in terms of features, where their frustration lives? So I guess surveying and stuff like that? Yeah, so actually, uh, after we were visiting the uh, IO1, Intermediate Union 1, we actually find their their gameplay and their control, their experience is quite simple. So we switch to a wider range of audience, maybe to find out other disability people, what they are kind of what they are thinking. Also, we may look into some physical therapy local to find out their needs and their thoughts of the game challenging of that part. Yeah, so we are still kind of digging to in this part. Yeah, um, so I noticed that you mentioned Ring Fit Adventure of an example of an accessibility menu. Um, would you find that to be, uh, I don't know, d d ahead of the pack, or uh, is that something that you're aiming for, or is that something that you're aiming to be better than? And um, have you looked into games like uh, Last of Us 2 has a, a really comprehensive d uh, accessibility menu, and I don't know, just like the research that you've done into accessibility menus, that's the question. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned the last of us. So they have like really comprehensive uh, accessibility options. So it's like very hard to understand, but they offer like a, a GIF in their game uh, option menu. Uh, there are also like some presets where if you have maybe uh, perception uh, conditions, so you can just choose this preset and then you can just maybe fine tune the option. But it's, it really is um, a, like a, a very painful uh, uh, program process because uh, you, as a player, you need to adjust those settings maybe mm, for a long time and then you can actually enjoy the game. So that's why we're trying to do the um, adaptive difficulty so that uh, the player doesn't need to go through all those process and they can just um, try to play the actual game from the beginning. Thank you. Good morning, we're Team Micro Beetle. My name is Sandra. I can have the clicker. My name is Sandra. I'm the producer and artist in the team. Uh, I'm Maria. I'm assistant producer and designer. I'm Robin. I'm one of the programmers. And uh, our client is Lou from West Liberty University, and our instructor is Ruth. And for our goals, we are helping the elementary school, mainly sixth graders, to understand the input and output from the programming side, which is Python or any programming language they're using. And we are using micro bits from BBC, which is a pocket size of computer, to help them to understand the process and have them have a better experience over the progress. And we are going to collaborate with two to three kids in the classroom, which is class size is about 20 kids. And we are also allow single player mode. And this experience is repeatable and not a fixed progress um, experience. So it's not going to be three ways in total, and it's going to be forever the same pattern. So thank you. So we're using Microbit as our input because our client wanted us to use it. It's um, affordable and pretty common in elementary schools. And we want to, it, it has two buttons and some LED displays, but we want to add more controllers to it. So we're using a Microbit expansion board so that we can attach external sensors and controllers to it. 
Um, students will be using this micro bit and connect it to the, their school's Chromebook, and the Chromebook will open up our Unity project. So the students can use micro bits as controllers to our Unity game virtual world. So we had to change our deliverables from a Chrome OS installation package to a Unity WebGL website um, because for two reasons. A, it's easier for us developers to handle the communi data communication between a web and a micro bit. But more importantly, it's easier for the teachers because all kinds of installation to the school's Chromebook will have to be approved by authorities. And so if the teachers can use a website, it will be much easier for them. We also had to change our design from a combat game like Pokemon-like to a maze game because our client told us that um, the idea of attacking others is not allowed in some kind of in elementary schools. So we want to change it to maze and hopefully it will be like more fun and more educational. Uh, we did some play testing sessions to help our design. Um, we, yeah, we built uh, four stations with different controllers and micro bits and they all map to different colors. And we wanted to test how students can understand input and output and then how, what kind of sensors they like and what kind of sensors they can understand. So you can see that in this video, different controllers map to different colors. We give students some worksheets so that they can fill out and we can check their understanding like how, how well they can finish this task. And also it gives us a chance to adjust the level of challenge of our puzzle. We conducted two playtesting sessions in two different elementary schools with about 20, session, uh, 20 students per session and with their teachers. So um, overall, the students enjoyed the process of mapping the controllers to the different colors. And some of them struggled a little bit because everyone was touching the sensors at the same time. So they had to do teamwork to like figure out what colors map to what sensors. But overall, they were able to like fill out the uh, worksheets pretty accurately. And they, it proves them that they can understand this level of complexity. And then they can work as a team. And for sensors, students prefer more immediate and, uh, and intuitive sensors like sliders or photoresistors. And more passive sensors, like maybe ultrasonic distance sensors or motion sensors confuses them. So we know what sensor we want to go through with our design. Thank you. Um, so as Robin mentioned, our experience pivoted from a combat game to a maze game. So this means that we will be asking students to apply the concepts of input and output using a micro bit to solve mazes and in the process, they will be overcoming obstacles and collecting gems. Um, that will be the main uh, experience. And to do this, we will be creating 3D uh, mazes, mazes in a 3D environment in a 2.5D view. So uh, this is a reference image from Animal Crossing. And so when students access our website, they will be presented with three uh, modes that they can play in. And this is inspired by games like Roblo Roblox, sorry, which was mentioned previously, and Minecraft, both of which uh, students this age have access to and are uh, well aware of how they work. And so the idea is that the story mode will be the main part of the experience where students will be introduced to the world of the game and where they will learn how to navigate input, output, output, sorry, and solve the mazes. And then play mode and creative mode serve as extensions of this main mode um, to tackle the problem of having an experience that is not one and done. So we will go into that um, more later. But first, we'll explain how story mode works so that you can get an understanding of what uh, students will be playing with. So story mode starts by meeting a guide, guiding character or mentor character. Here you can see uh, 3D models created by your artist and a sample idle animation. So this guiding character is a micro beetle, which is a creature exactly like a beetle, but way more intelligent and ingenious and capable of engineering their own technological devices. And so the player is also a micro beetle, a young one. And um, be micro beetles are incredible, incredibly sorry, adventurous, and they love going around the world and tackling different adventures. Uh, and in our game, that, that translates into mazes. 
So this young micro beetle has to prove that uh, they can go out into the world and tackle all these different adventures. And so there is something called the cavern challenge, which is a rite of passage in our world. And the mentor character will be helping the player character to prepare and then successfully overcome this challenge. Thank you. So for the first step of our story mode, the player will name their characters and also have a chance to customize them, like choosing the texture, color, and also the shape of the our main character. And the picture below is the model we have for the character. And here's our customer demonstration demo. Um, so when we, uh, so for now we can choose texture and color and also uh, choose some shape of our character. And after we hit the OK button, uh, 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 we can save uh, the, pl uh, the player chooses for the next stage. Yeah. And for the next stage of our story mode, the player will have to wire three sensors or controller, which uh, all, all of three co corresponds to the in-game devices, like the slider corresponds to the jackhammers. And then uh, the players will test what, what they have for the wiring system and follow the guidance uh, with our mentor characters, see if the wiring systems work or not. And for the next stage, uh, the, uh, our player will fill in uh, the, the data uh, and then uh, they will see how the data works in the uh, programming system. And they will fill in the programming blocks and fill in some parameters and understand some basic game logic in the programming data, uh, in the programming box, and which it will uh, uh, control the drag hammer, how it works when you fix with some obstacles. Uh, yep. And so in the story mode, the player has three main goals. The first one is collect all gems. The second one is overcoming all the obstacles, including waterfall, rock, and, and the mouse. And the third one is reaching the exit. There's an example of how the player will overcome a rock. So first, the character encounter a rock. So to equip a useful tool, which is jackhammer, the player need to press button A and button B on the micro bits. Uh, the player will keep pressing the button until there is a T icon um, shows on the micro bit screen. And once there's a T icon shows on the micro bit screen, uh, there will be a jackhammer appear on the character. Once the character is equipped with the jackhammer, the player can control the slider to operate the jackhammer. Then the jackhammer will break the, the rock. This is a way to um, overcome the rock. Um, here is a demo showing how the player can use sensors and micro bits to, um, to, sol to solve the obstacles. So this demo shows that the player can use the water sensor to equip the diving gills and the and a slider to operate the jackhammers. So um, by the time the maze is solved, this means that the rite of passage or tutorial, let's say, has been completed. So um, there is a recognition of the achievement uh, that the player has done by the part of the mentor character. Um, and so now that means that the player can go on to play the other two modes in the game. So play mode is essentially the same as story mode, except that there is no mentor a character, and the player gets to pick a maze um, instead of being given one. So these mazes ha will have a more complicated layout than the tutorial maze, and they will also be themed by biomes. So our idea is that this represents different parts of the world that the micro beetle goes on to have their adventure set. 
And then in creation mode or creative mode is where the student not only um, does the wiring and programming of devices that they have already done previously, but they also take on the role of maze builder or designer uh, and pick up certain parameters and place different objects for other students to then be able to play their maze. So for our next steps is finish up the design of the maze and up our assets. And we have a big play testing days. First is October 25th. It's, uh, it's another one is on the Sunday, the biggest ETC's play testing day. And by the day, we should have a website for players to testing every result. And as we, our final deliverable to our client is a complete gate a kit for um, how to put things together and a user guide for the teachers who are going to take control of it. And also, as a reminder, we have uh, three models for the kids to play with this experience. One is story mode, and one is creator mode, and another one is player mode. And we're using micro bits, and hopefully they'll have a better experience understanding how input and output works in the programming language. And thanks for uh, being here, and we're open to questions. So I just wanted a clarifying question. So my impression is that if you have a group of students that are all gonna be playing this game at the same time, is that right? So my impression is that each of them will probably likely grab one of the input devices, right? And I guess my concern is that the player steering the character, who I guess is using the arrow keys on the computer, will have most control over the experience with the other characters essentially just like following the task once they get to a boulder, does that make sense? And so the power and creative control over the play experience is really with the person driving the character around. Are there ways that the inputs can be used in like you know, the slider or whatever to give the players with the other inputs more control over or more creative input into how the play experience unfolds? Um, so we, we thought about that um, in terms of also moving with input, uh, physical inputs. The micro bit, you know, the pins are limited and uh, the wiring can be complicated. So we decided to go with the keyboard. Um, from our play testing, uh, we were not play testing this experience exactly, but we did notice a lot of collaboration going on and conversation and wanting to work together. Um, so as of now, our impression is that sixth graders are able to work in that way. Um, but it is definitely something that we have to consider and see if it's a problem once we actually play test the experience because Thank you're you. right. Thank you. So the uh, slider with a jackhammer implies it goes on, off, on, off, on, off, that, that it's a, a longer interactive time with the input device. I think right now you have it just on, that it's just like a switch. Is there an intent to have interactions with the input devices? So, so if, if, I hope I'm answering this, I understand correctly, but so for example, for the slider, the way in the programming part, um, there's this part where they can put in from what value to what value the slider should be going to be successful at overcoming the obstacle. So there is a sense of this specific controller is not just on and off, but it also goes from one value to another. And we were thinking of it like jackhammers are not necessarily charged, but like maybe you have to gain some sort of momentum or something from, to make it work. Um, so yeah, I, we, we're trying to make the design match what the sensors and controllers actually do, as opposed to trying to force, uh, to force it to work in a way that it no, is not necessarily. So in the case of the slider, we are showing them like, hey, you can measure input from two different extremes coming from this specific controller, if that makes sense. I hope. Yeah, and, and the question is, will you allow your logic to say the slider has to bounce, has to go forward and has to go backward and has to go forward? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Also, our logic includes the how fast they should go. Like, if you go from zero to the max, but if you go it really slow, it actually doesn't work. You need to go it really fast to um, activate your jackhammer. Uh, 
Um, in the uh, creative part, um, so just to make sure I'm getting this correct, they can make mazes for other students to use. Uh, are there rules that you guys are giving them to keep them from making it, it, impossible mazes? So uh, that was very important um, for us. We don't want to break the game in terms of experience or technology. So the plan is that the three maze layouts that they can access in play mode are option layouts that they can choose from in creative mode. But then they can also like mix and match the theme or the biome. And in creative mode, they also get to place the obstacles and gems. Um, so, and choose which kinds of obstacles they want. Something I forgot to mention is that in play mode, they get introduced to two new kinds of obstacles that match to two new kinds of sensors. So they will also have access to that in creative mode. Um, so they're not actually designing the maze layout, but they're populating it and choosing different parameters for it. Uh, so you have multiple different modes. There's definitely a lot of things uh, going on here. One of the things I guess I wanted to understand was you showed the programming for the jackhammer, for example. Do the students have to create that from scratch, or do you provide that and then they, they edit it? Which, which way does that go? Uh, so for now, um, I provide the values that students and teachers can change, like the speed and the value. Yeah, just to add to that, you can see that there previously is a programming, a block programming interface. So students get to change the values, the parameters in that interface. So for example, they can choose what pin the, the micro bits gets the input from, and then what obstacle is going to tackle. So to further clarify, the white fields here are what they get to change. So we give them the, the template, let's say, because okay. this, it, at its core, this is not a programming experience. So they get to see how it works and how the logic works. But what is most important for us is that they get to understand how they can use values from the input to affect, to have an output. Let's say. Thanks. So that's where in creative mode, once they have gone through the other ones, obviously this will be controlled by the, a teacher, um, but that's where they get more freedom. So they would also have this, but you know, if for some reason they want the slider to uh, be the controller that overcomes not the rock, but the waterfall, I guess it's up to them. Um, but the idea is that it's more guided at the beginning so that the educational part of this is clear. And then in creative mode, we assume that they already understand and they can do whatever they want within some constraints. Hi everyone, we are Team Artisan, and our project is Procedure Generation Pipeline plus Open World with Tang Dynasty. And these are our team members, our instructors, and subject matter expertise. So the overview and goal of this project is to design and build a procedure generation pipeline with historical data. And this kind of historical data can be interpreted as historical architecture and culture of Tang Dynasty. As one of the enabling technologies for open world game creation, 
This pipeline should provide complete and reusable solutions for large-scale cityscape generation and world design, ultimately not only for Tang Dynasty, but also for other time periods and cultural themes as needed. And we'll finally make an interactive demonstration for this pipeline, the Tang Dynasty cityscape. Our implementation tools are Unreal Engine 5 and Houdini FX. So the pipeline can be summarized as create and parameterize single uh, building modules in Houdini, merged into single buildings, and implement building classes and placement in Unreal Engine 5, and finally export deliverables. So more development details will be presented in the order of the pipeline. First of all, the building modules. At the beginning of the pipeline, we did a lot of research and referred to a lot of historical materials and deconstructed the architectural structure of Tang Dynasty, which can be used as the prerequisite logic for our subsequent procedurally modeling. And Yin Zi will continue. When we design how to create our building modules, we split them into two different parts. Um, the first one is um, the building structures that will only be copied and pasted in Houdini instead of being stretched. And the other is stretchable parts. So for part structures that will not be stretched in Houdini, we have a Dogon bracket structure, which is shown here, and other ornaments such as doors and windows. Uh, we will use 3D software to model them and import them into Houdini as file and match them to certain positions as we want. So for the Dogon bracket structure here, we refer to a historical building called Foguang Temple, which was, which was built in Tang Dynasty and well preserved until now in China. For the stretchable part, um, we have foundations with stairs, building walls, and roof. So all of them were created in Houdini by nodes. Their uh, width, length, height, and even the number of stairs can be adjusted very easily. Roof is an important part of our building, and here is how we iterated it. For the first step, we, create, we created bent curves from the edges of the wall and skinned them as flat faces. However, this very um, first version didn't have the closed top structure, and the edges of the roof were not straight lines. So based on this version, we figured out how to draw a better shape of roof, like the middle one, the second version. And then we added more wooden structures and tiles to make it more realistic. Now I will invite Eliza to talk more about our building. So I'll continue with the single building part. There are three kinds of building we're going to make. The wealthy residential, the regular residential, and the landmarks such as temple and palace. As you can see here, we begin our work in Houdini by doing the two most basic part of the house, which is the roof and foundation. We already merged and parameterized them so that our users are able to adjust the length, width, size, and more details in real time. Well, the first challenge we have among all the slightly dead ends was the performance issue. As you can see here, our roof iteration three has already more than 70,000 points. It might not be that problematic if there is only one building in the map. However, imagine we have hundreds or even thousands of them, and our users have to adjust any of the parameters involving the roof. It will take such a long time to compile. In our last video, everything seems OK, because we have speeds up the video a lot, and the actual waiting time was much longer than that. So here we come up with our solution. We go back to our roof version 2, which is a more simplified version with lower poly, and we remove most of the Boolean for each loop, which might be pretty time consuming for Houdini to compile. And we're going to represent some of the tiling details in Substance Designer using textures. And after that, you're going to use the Houdini Auto UE function so that whenever our users changes the dimension of the roof, the texture and UE will follow up. Fortunately, with this method in mind, we have successfully decreased the number of points by more than 90%. And we think we're going to continue with this method after half. 
and these are our future plans. S uh, simply speaking, more texture, more methods, and also more iteration. And next, I will invite Jimmy. Thank you, Eliza. So in the following section, I'm going to walk through about uh, the pipeline after we have the building. So first of all, uh, we are going to uh, depict the outline of the city with the wall and road tools. And these tools are uh, inspired by the Houdini starter kit. So by, uh, by, using, uh, by exposing the parameters in Houdini, we can adjust the, uh, the model with different kinds of textures and in the auditor times in Unreal Engine. So uh, in terms of the development process, we first uh, formulate the procedural rules uh, of the Houdini digital asset. And then we can uh, ch choose what parameters that we want the users to use. Then we define the layout in Unreal Engine and transmit those uh, coordinate input into the HDAs. And as you can see in the video, we can uh, adjust the texture of the asset and also use the parameters we set in the Houdini. And this is our early version of the wall tool, which we solely developed in the Unreal Engine using the spline tool. Uh, however, uh, it is very hard to customize uh, each single model, and also the uh, usage of it is very time consuming. Then we iterated the tool in Houdini and solved several problems like uh, the ro rotation issues and also setting the input between these two platforms. And this is our current version. Uh, as you can see, we can add more details onto the wall, and also we can apply different kinds of textures. And there's a second input of this tool that can uh, remove part of the wall. And we are considering using this functionality to build things like doors and windows. And next is the road tool. And we plan to use this tool to build our first level road system of the city. And the logic is quite similar to the wall tool. Some difference are, uh, differences are we can make an intersections when there are multiple splines meet. And we can adjust the road according to its skewness and height. And last, we can make the road look more lively by adding different kinds of ornaments, trees, and props. However, uh, the performance issue uh, highly influences our development process. As the HDF files uh, gets larger, the calculation efforts grows as well. So as a result, we uh, often face uh, th things like lagging issues and also uh, unstable outcomes. And currently, we try to solve this problem by uh, baking single instance after we customize the model, and then we will manually place them into the world. Also, we try to lower the amount of meshes in the environment, and these solutions work quite, quite well right now. Other than that, we are still trying to figure out how to, uh, uh, how to use uh, multiple input sources and how to reference the HDA fields within the Unreal Engine blueprint. And we will uh, keep solving these problems along our learning path. And next, I will invite Shunan to talk more about our layout algorithm. Thanks, Jimmy. Next, I'm going to talk about CT generation. So the whole process is separated into two steps. Generate white boxes and attach metadata such as scale and function to them. Then replace those white boxes with our generated assets. After doing some city layout research and inspired by modern art, we tried a first version with subdivision algorithm to generate the city layout. Here's the result. We, we can use the subdivision block generator to parameterize the look of a grid. And uh, we, we can add constraints to control, control the minimal size, width, and height of divided blocks. However, two challenges come with subdivision algorithm. First, it is too random to control the width and the length of each block. Second, we found a, infer, a, a reference image from the other as a artist. And we found it is hard to achieve an organized layout based on this image. So based on the historical research, the basic unit of a town city called a ward. A standard ward contains 16 blocks, and the blocks are composed of different building clusters. 
So we implement version two with great feeling algorithm to achieve the historical look of a word. The word generator defines how a word looks like. The user can parameterize attributes such as the skill, social status, and the function of each block. Each block takes required building clusters dimensions as input and performs the grid filling algorithm to place building clusters in the block grid. Here's the result. You can see there's a version with white boxes and another version with replaced assets. Next, I'm going to talk about the placement. Here we will showcase how we use the tools and the create town-like city. So far, this is our half version of the city layout generation. For the future plan, we want to iterate the wood generator with different algorithms to achieve a better result and automate the placement process. So next, I will invite Egon to talk about the deliverables. So the final deliverables of this project will be the documentation that describes the entire pipeline, the related tools, and the source code as well as the interactive demonstration, the Tang Dynasty Cityscape. And our target demographic will be game developers, such as technical artists, and we hope the pipeline can be directly applied to the entire product development process to help them create various cultural themes and cityscape genres. In terms of the metrics matrix, we plan to evaluate the reusability and the ap application effectiveness of the pipeline itself and the visual aesthetics and the reasonability for game of the demonstration, the Tang Dynasty Cityscape. Thank you for listening. We're open to questions. What's the total time that uh, in the last video? Uh, well, first of all, um, it's great to see like the different pieces come together. You have the the buildings, the walls, and then the city layout, right? Those are all your assets. That's great to see. What was the total time it took to create that city in, in engine and out of engine? So uh, I think the total time to create a city is about 17 to 20 minutes, but uh, we actually add s some extra time to like re refine the texture of it. So it maybe takes more like uh, 20 to 30 minutes. But I think that is like greatly reduced from if you have to handmade all the all the city. Yep. Okay. Uh, your your grid system. Uh, will will it allow me to? And I'll just say what I want to do. So let's say I I have a market, or you know that I have a river going through my environment. Um, will it, will it select which buildings and which types of homes, et cetera, will go near certain structures for me. And that way, like when it generates a grid, it generates a grid with respect to a few key points that are put in. Is that something that this will allow for, or is that out of scope? I think for the first step, so you just create a landscape, and then you manually place all the buildings like along the landscape. So if you have a river, we just place the buildings beside, so we manually do that. So later, uh, as a one of the stretch goal, we might consider uh, if there's a river, uh, and the, you, the, the tool can automatically detect there's a river and place something along it. So that's the stretch goal, yeah.
So your target demographic are game developers and technical artists. Do you have any thoughts on how you might play test or use that audience as a way to verify that your system is working the way that audience would want it to work? I think we will invite uh, technical artists among ETC and uh, other game developers to come and use and try our tools to create a city like what we did in the video and uh, get feedbacks uh, like ask them how do they feel about those tools and uh, what can be in, what can be improved and uh, what's the result you think? I would like to hear some more about the design and creation of things that are are not buildings and also a little bit more about like the layout relative to you you talked about there's different um, types of buildings so you know you have an iconic structure you have a, a high um, a high income <laughs> family building and then you have like an average person. How do they relate to each other? So how does the actual life of the city get represented in these uh, algorithms? Um, okay, so we did some research. So the um, different, so we found in each ward there was uh, at least some uh, wealthy residential, some regular residential, and they're different in their types of roof and the texture which they have. And also the placement of them, like one wealthy residential might be much larger and they have some garden and trees. So that's um, on design, they quite look differently. So we're gonna decide, we first make the wealthy residential, especially the roof, and then we go to a more simplified version that will be the more regular ones. And our stretch goal and after house will be uh, like the landmarks, such as the temple and palace, because those, they have more unique size and they're also their designs. Um, does that answer your questions or? I'd say that that starts to answer it. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there's some thought about like how, where are these, where these things are placed. And for instance, you have some trees in that image and like how do you decide where trees go or where maybe, you know, pens for animals, or I don't even know what kind of other things besides houses might be there. Uh, we were first based on the historical research, um, since we have some map about how do, those, how do some typical wards, they present the uh, locations of different residentials and landmark. And also um, for us as an artist, we're also considering how um, for an aesthetic kind of view, uh, is it looking good for, um, to put it in the, in, um, to put it in this structure. So we are balancing between like representing the historical data and also having an aesthetic of showing whether this placement is um, correct or, or looking good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.